the main perspective. We are excited to have you here today. My name is Jessica Reed. I'm the Clinical Quality Manager for the Maine Medical Association Center for Quality Improvement, and I will be your facilitator for the webinar today, along with my colleague, Mary Milam, who will be handing the chat and all the technical aspects of the webinar. All right, why don't we get started? Perfect, thank you, Mary. So again, welcome to Radon Risk Reduction, the current policy landscape in the US and the main perspective. We are so excited to have three wonderful presenters for you all today. We have Jonathan Dyer, the main radon coordinator for the radon control program, radon program, Maine CDC, Division of Environmental and Community Health. Sarah Downer, Associate Director, Whole Person Care Center for Health, Law and Policy Innovation, Harvard Law School, and Rachel Landauer, a clinical fellow at the Center for Health, Law, Policy Innovation, Harvard Law School. Next slide, please. We also wanna take this time to very gratefully thank our funders, which make this webinar possible. The Bristol Myers Scribb Foundation, the Maine Cancer Foundation, the Maine Economic Improvement Fund, and Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield. Again, many thanks to our funders to make this possible. Just a couple of quick housekeeping slides for you all, important webinar notes. You are all in listen only mode for the webinar version of Zoom. Please use the chat feature to ask any questions or make comments that you have. We are gonna answer those questions at the end of the presentation. We find that just really helps with the flow of everything. And uh, we'll, we have set aside time at the end to specifically do that. If we don't get a chance to answer all the questions, please know that we will develop a question answer sh um, sheet and we will get those answers from our presenters and we will send that out with the slide deck after the webinar to all of you. The video screen size and location is adjustable by clicking in the top corner of the boxes and dragging. And this is also important if you're joining by phone or with others on the same computer and will be looking for CEUs, it's important for you to enter your information into the chat window or send your name and email to Mary Milam, who will take care of the CME process. Again, for CME, we have a disclosure for today. Today's speakers do not have any relevant financial relationships with the manufacturers of any commercial products and or provider of commercial services discussed in this CME activity. CME will be available for participants who have signed into the live webinar. If there are, again, multiple people at one computer, please type their names and addresses into the chat box for our attendance records. We do not have separate nursing CEUs, but you can get a CME certificate. Once the webinar is ended by the host, you will get a pop-up on your screen that will direct you to the survey. If you leave the meeting before that happens, please contact Mary Milam at mainmed.com and she'll be able to help you with that. Please complete the survey via SurveyMonkey within two weeks. And for the CME documentation process, What's really nice is that you will be able to actually immediately download your CME certificate on the last page of the survey. So once you finish the survey, you'll see this pop-up come up and you can download it and print it. And again, if you have any trouble with that at all, please contact Mary. And if um, we have any questions or again, don't hesitate to reach out. Today's learning objectives, we're gonna be talking so that all of you when you walk away can hopefully describe US state laws, policies and practices for radon disclosure, detection, and mitigation. You will also be able to identify characteristics of model policies for radon disclosure, detection, and mitigation for residences, schools, and businesses. Number three, describe opportunities for improving radon disclosure, detection, and mitigation in Maine, and describe current Maine programs related to, ra related to radon testing and mitigation. So we have a quick poll question for you all. We are gonna have um, some poll questions scattered throughout this webinar, which we're very excited about. And if you just scroll down, you'll see this, this poll question will pop up on the screen like it just did now and just click. We're just looking to just kind of get an idea of, of who's attending um, for our presenters. So if you could fill in uh, where you, what, what, which of the following best represents your area of work? That will be great. We're going to give it a few more seconds. Thank you all. Okay, Mary. <clears throat> so it looks like we have 
pretty close to the same um, with healthcare providers, right on testing and mitigation experts, 31 and 39%, some healthcare administrators, researchers, government, and others. This is wonderful. We have a nice mixture of all of you. And again, are so grateful that you're all here with us today. All right, we're all set with that, Mary. Okay, so today, again, <clears throat> our title is Rate on Risk Reduction, the Current Policy Landscape in the U.S. and the Main Perspective. And it's, we're really excited to bring both of these perspectives to all of you today. So our first speaker is going to be Jonathan Dyer. He is a uh, chemist and has been involved with the Radon and Main for over 30 years. He was the founder and owner of a Laboratory, Inc. and Radon Diagnostic Laboratory until he sold the companies in 2014. And during his ownership, he conducted over 80,000 huge number, John, of air radon and water radon tests. He's been the primary radon contact for the state of Maine for the last two years as the Maine radon coordinator. And his responsibilities this capacity include managing Maine's air and water radon service, provide a regulatory program, and it's nearly 150 in individual licenses, inspecting radon mitigation systems when there's a complaint, giving radon presentations to the general public, and technical training to the Maine radon industry, as well as answering general and technical questions from Maine residents in the Maine radon industry. So again, John, we'd so appreciate you joining us today, and I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, being Radon Awareness Month, I think this webinar is, is very apropos, so I really appreciate the chance to, uh, to give my uh, presentation. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. Yeah, thanks. Let me just read the disclosure first. Um, I do not have any real or apparent conflicts of interest that may have a direct bearing on the subject matter of this uh, continuing edu education program. And before I get into the, um, before I, with this slide, I just wanted to, just give you a quick introduction to, to radon in Maine. And, and um, studies have shown that there are two atoms of radon emitted from every square centimeter of earth uh, every second of every day. So it's not if you have radon, it's, it's how much you're exposed to it. In Maine, our bedrock contains uh, uranium, which is a naturally occurring radioactive element. And be, being radioactive, it decays or transforms um, into other elements called daughter products or progenies. Um, and one element at a time. And during this transformation, the atoms emit an ended, uh, a radiation uh, called ionizing radiation in the form of alpha, beta, or, or, or gamma particles. And that's what the problem is with radon. It's not the radon molecule itself. It's when it transforms into another element, polonium, bismuth, something like that, that it kicks out an alpha particle. And if you're breathing it into the lung at the time it kicks out that alpha particle, it could do a lot of damage to the, to the DNA. Um, one of the progeny of uranium is radon, and it's really unique in that radon is a gas. And because it's a gas, it has the ability to solubilize in the water table. So when you sink a borehole down for a well, you may pull up the radon in the water. It also is able to um, uh, flow up through the uh, cracks and fissures in bedrock and end up, because of pressure differentials between the soil and the, and the house, end up being in your home. And in fact, the tighter the home, the better the radon collector. In 1989, the Maine Radon uh, uh, Registration Act was introduced. And uh, what it did was give us, the state of Maine, the power to license anybody that dealt with radon. And um, that meant testing, mitigating, or consulting. And that's what we do here. Um, we license over 150 service providers. That's consultants, mitigators, testers. Uh, we go out and we inspect systems that, if a customer calls and complains that the system's not working, the mitigation system, we can go out and take a look at it. When you become a, a tester or a mitigator, it, it's more than just taking courses. We require you to take a national exam, so you have to pass a national exam. Every year you have to submit to me your quality assurance plan showing that you know what you're talking about, you know what you're doing. We require that every um, service provider uh, take continuing education courses. So, and this is always, and we're always on the upkeep, always checking on our uh, service providers to make sure that they're, they're doing a quality work. Uh, we offer training classes. We give presentations to associations. Uh, we answer general and technical questions for Maine residents and Maine radon industry. And, and um, having been in this, this, this position here for a while, I, I thought I'd heard everything, but I will just share one, one thing with you. To, even though we, Maine has been pushing radon this, for the last 30 years, I had somebody call me last week and say that, um, was it true that if you have spiders in your basement, you won't have radon because radon kills spiders, which I'd never heard before. I had to look it up. I wasn't sure, but 
I know that's not correct because spiders don't even have lungs. I think they have something called spiracles. So it just this disinformation or these myths are why we're, we're constantly here. And it just it just never never fails to amaze me the all the questions that come in. One of the parts of the program, if you're a, a ray, ray down service provider, is that the 15th of the following month you have to turn in all your data by um, by address for every home that you've inspected or mitigated. And um, we keep that data, we put it in a database, and we'll be talking about that um, in a little while. Uh, we also work with organizations like the Maine Indoor Air Quality Association, the Maine Lung Association, and we, uh, from time to time, are involved in writing rules uh, for legislative approval. Uh, next. Thanks. Just want to give you a brief history of, um, of radon in Maine. Maine's been looking at radon for the, like the last 60 years. And uh, it all started back in like 1958, Probably none of you my age, but back then it was the Cold War and everybody in the house had a Geiger counter. And the story is that in Newry or in Bethel, Maine, uh, some um, high school kid uh, took, his, took his dad's uh, Geiger counter, went down cellar and found out that the, the, the water holding tank, pressure tank, was clicking like crazy. And so come to find out, yeah, we have, uh, we have radon in our water. And um, now to come to find out, we have a lot of radon in Maine. Just to let you know, an average um, radon is measured in Pico Curies per liter. Curie is named after um, Madame Marie Curie in the turn of the last century. She coined the word radioactive. Um, the limit is 4.0. That's the action level. If it's 4.0 or above Pico Curie's per liter, you should get your radon mitigated. National average is around 1.6 Pico Curie's per liter. Main average is 4.3. So already Maine's above the, uh, above the action level, even to start with. 1989, the Maine Registration Act was introduced, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, in 2009, Title 14, Chapter 10 came out and it required all multifamily housing, all apartment houses, be tested and mitigated. But later on, the uh, mitigation uh, segment was removed from that. In 2010, uh, Maine Uniform and Energy Business uh, Code adopted the um, uh, rules for building new residences. Uh, residential properties uh, would have to have radon. Uh, mitigation systems already built into them, but at that time it was uh, voluntary. Next slide. Sure. So in 2014, the rental testing law for the multifamilies went into effect, and uh, in that year, you'll see there was a big spike in um, in testing for rental properties. It, it really shot up, and now that goes to effect. Every new rental property it doesn't matter whether you own a thousand units or you or your kids moved out of the basement and some person's moving into your basement. You have to check it for radon. <clears throat> In 2019, the Radon Building Code uh, came out, and in 2019, it was made mandatory. And we'll be talking about that as well. And also in 2019, an act to authorize public schools to periodically test for, for radon um, was enacted. Uh, next, please. Okay, the Maine Radon Registration Act, when it came out, it said it established the rules, fees, and penalties for all radon service providers. Um, a person who performs a radon testing, mitigation, or consulting, they must be um, they must be licensed by us. Um, you cannot advertise radon testing unless you're licensed by us and you actually do it. And uh, as I said, all requirements for radon is uh, once you do your testing and your and your, your mitigation, you have to send us the data on a spreadsheet um, depicting you know the, the address and what you got for results and everything else. Um, that's that's part of the part of your licensing. Uh, next, please. Okay, the Maine Uniform Building Code, uh, uh, it was, it was uh, adopted and, and at one point when it was mandatory, populations under 4,000 didn't really have to worry about putting on a residential uh, or radon resistant construction. But now as of uh, September, 2019, uh, that's no matter what the population is, if your municipality is over 4,000 population and you're re required to enforce these codes uh, according to, and you see up in the title there, ASTM, E1465-08. That's a code by ASTM that tells you how to install the systems, what piping to use, how you install it, what type of fans to use, where you place it. And I do have the electronic copy of this. So if anybody is interested, my email will be at the end of this these slide presentations. So I'd be happy to send you a copy of that ASTM uh, E1465 for you. Uh, populations under 4,000, you may not have a code enforcement officer if you're under 4,000 because you're a small town. So uh, you may not have a code enforcement officer coming in and saying, oh, this wasn't done properly, but uh, it has to be built according to, to a standard. So if you don't do it the correct way, you may not get a certificate of occupancy to, to, to move in. Uh, next, please. 
Okay. Uh, last year, a bill came out uh, for radon testing in schools, and it recommended that school administrative units to test uh, schools and, and um, uh, the other buildings to be tested for radon every five years. And they were going to follow the EPA standards for testing for schools, and then they were going to report uh, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services are going to make a report every five years to the to the governor and the legislature. Um, the, the bill also recommends that school administrative units uh, to build schools, the new schools that are going to be built will have to have a radon resistant new construction built into them or have at least the techniques built in there. Uh, what I didn't say, and I'm making quotation marks with my fingers, this all says if funding is available. If funding is available, like that can't be done. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services will prepare a report and um, no later than October 1st of 2025 and every five years after that is submitted to the legislature and the governor. At this point in time, we do have a grant um, for doing some testing and some schools have shown interest in getting that done. COVID sort of throws a monkey wrench into everything. And uh, because when we test schools, we would like to test the schools during the school hours that the kids are there and during the cold winter months, because that'll give you your worst scenario or your highest readings. The other part of this formula is that we've got to have transparency. I want parents to know what's going on, faculty and staff. So what's driving up transparency letters to make sure that everybody knows what's going on because the schools will be the second highest exposure rate radiation the kids will have for radon. Homes will be number one. And if you do the schools, maybe the kids will take some of this home and, may, and maybe more homes will be tested. But radon will be your most exposure to radiation in your lifetime. Um, next, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, as of last January, we got together and put together a um, data. We finally took all the data that we had and we put it together to, uh, to make some, some semblance out of it of what all this data meant. We had been collecting, uh, we started collecting ad, uh, address specific data since 2009. Before that, it was, um, it was just zip code. Uh, and, and we hope to add on uh, mitigation into this eventually. Um, we haven't added it on yet, but we will, because a lot of the New England states do do mitigation tracking as well. Um, it's interesting to know that Maine's mitigation numbers per population are probably double any other New England state, uh, but it's not due to because we have more radon than anyone else. Um, I think it's just due to because we've, we've done much more much more work on that on that subject of mitigation and, and uh, keeping track of it. Um, starting in 2014, the Maine radon program also was a clearinghouse for landlords and renters to uh, collect their rental unit data. And this data is compiled, it's clean, and it's geocoded. And then it's sent um, uh, to us and uh, Rachel Sukforth, who's the assistant coordinator, she does all the heavy lifting. So she's the one that compiles it all, puts it all in the data thing. All I do is talk on the phone. Rachel does all the heavy work. Um, the data is being uploaded on online portal, and I'll show you that in a second where you can go to it. It's a very handy tool for home inspectors, for realtors, anybody that's really interested in, and I'll show that to you in a second. Last year, we collected about 19,000, a little over 19,000 radon tests that we've, um, that we've punched into the, into the data. And much of this is due to real estate transactions and, uh, and the radon disclosure law. Uh, next, please. Okay, at this point in time, thanks. at this point in time, we have approximately um, 60,000 distinct data points. And um, it, in, in this space, and it's, it it's can also can be compared to our main behavioral risk factor surveillance data, our briefers. Um, the maps show maximum values at town levels. You can go to the town, find your town, find what the highest level ever recorded for radon is there. You can find what percentage of, uh, is over four, what percentage is over two. It's just really interesting. Our only challenges were, and you'll see on the map, a lot of the gray areas are the, are the um, uh, counties that are very low in population, therefore much lower real estate transactions. So we don't have that much data. And also if you're more of a low income, whatever, uh, low income area, and if you find you have radon, you may not have the money you know, to, to do the mitigation. So there's no real excitement about getting the test done in the first place. Uh, the takeaway on this whole data was radon levels vary from house to house, but it, it, you can't avoid it. It's there. So I recommend a test. The, um, Tracking uh, right here is the uh, link to get to that. Uh, but as I say, uh, I think they're going to have uh, the um, all the uh, uh, PowerPoints are going to come out to everyone, so you can pick it up there, or you can just Google Maine Tracking Network. Uh, next, please. This is a picture of what the map will look like when you go to it. Also, this uh, this portal also shares other portals that you can look up: arsenic, uranium, 
ticks. You can see it. So this has got everything on it. So you can find out which is the most in each state, find out what is here. So for instance, you can see all the gray area, which we don't have much data for. Down here, mostly the southern southern part of Maine, and we have a lot of data. And you can rearrange this and, and map it and chat it. It's just a lot of fun to play with if you get a chance. It's a very, very, very useful tool. Uh, next. OK, where are we now? There is no main law that says a person cannot live in a house with elevated radon levels. Okay, that's why if uh, um, uh, if a landlord finds that he has a high level of radon, he's not required to fix it. Okay, uh, <clears throat> not required to fix the radon problem. He is, however, required to uh, let the tenants know what's going on. I'll explain that in a second. Um, uh, well, actually, it's the next one. They are required to disclose their radon levels within 30 days to existing tenants and to new tenants. And say your level comes in high, as a tenant, you can choose to stay or not stay. And if you if you leave, um, you have to get your security deposit back, and the and the landlord cannot use radon as a reason for eviction. <clears throat> At this point in time, real estate transactions require only a, a yes or no or unknown for disclosure for radon, but uh, it does put the topic up front and, um, for the buyer at the time when they are considering a home inspection. The realtors are on the front lines when the, when it comes to people knowing about radon. And I do get a lot of my calls come from out of state. People are going to buy a house in, in Maine and they've heard about radon. They want to know what's 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 going on. Uh, next. Okay. What's the future hold? Um, since the realtors are on the front line, I would love to see if I had a bucket list. Uh, I would really like to see uh, the realtors have at least a one hour training course in radon every year as part of their license. Because as I say, they're the ones that that are giving out the information and um, and I, I wanna make sure that the information is correct and not disinformation. And uh, so I think a one, a one hour course would be great for realtors. Uh, I've developed a three hour class approved by the Real Estate Commission uh, for, for real estate agents and they can take it, it costs nothing, it's free. Um, Maybe the real estate transactions should be a little more uh, uh, red flagged, like say warning, you know, this, this, uh, this could have uh, radon on your property and radon has been known to, ca to cause cancer or they're known to be a radon risk, uh, you know, a number one carcinogen, but um, that's, we'll have to see if that happens. I'd love to see radon, uh, require radon testing as a condition of sale. That would be great. Again, that, that hasn't happened yet. Um, we'd like to see additional testing and mitigation requirements uh, for people in prisons and nursing homes and things like that, but we're still uh, still working on that. We haven't, uh, haven't come up with that yet. Right now, we have jurisdiction over multifamily homes and residential, low-rise residential buildings. Uh, the last thing I'm looking at would be to establish a uh, radon mitigation assistance program to provide financial assistance to low-income individuals that need radon. Right now, um, I believe the main uh, indoor air quality association has something called window dressing. And uh, with that program, we try to get um, mitigators to work at cost, even work for free on some homes, putting in systems. But as of this point in time, we have no, no, way, no financial assistance um, available on that. And I think uh, the questions I believe are gonna be saved till the end. This is my cell phone number and this is my um, email. So if you want a copy of the 1465, please let me know and, and thank you for letting me speak today. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was excellent and a wealth of information. I know I learned a ton. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you being here with us today. So at this point, I would also like to, we're gonna move into the second half of our presentation. So Mary, if you could advance the slide. And Sarah and uh, Rachel, perf oh, there you are, perfect. So again, we'd like to go into the second half of our presentation. Um, our first speaker is gonna be Sarah Downer. I briefly introduced her in the beginning, but she's the Associate Director of the Whole Person Care at the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation at Harvard Law School, where she uses law and policy as tools to encourage person-centered care at every point of interaction with the healthcare system. She created the Center's Social Determinants of Health Law Lab, a project dedicated to analyzing novel legal issues that arise when the healthcare system interacts with individuals and communities in a new way. And she also is the co-author of the forthcoming issue brief, Issue Risk Reduction, a Fractured Policy Landscape. And next, and I'll introduce Rachel and then I'll turn it over to you, Sarah. 
our speak, co-speaker with Sarah is going to be Rachel uh, Landauer. She is a clinical fellow at the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation of Harvard Law School, and her works at the center focus on a range of healthcare access and public health issues, and at the intersection of the healthcare system and innovative services to address clinical health-related social needs. She graduated from UCLA Law School in May of 2016 as the member of the David J. Epstein Program in Public Interest Law and Policy, and with a Master of Public Health degree from the UCLA UCLA Fielding School of Public Health, and she is a licensed member of the California Bar. So again, welcome to both of you. We're so excited to have you here today. And Sarah, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Thanks to our host today and to our co-presenter, John, who has a wealth of information, amazing information. Um, it is our pleasure to be here. My name is Sarah Downer, the Associate Director at the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation of Harvard Law School, presenting today with my colleague, Rachel. And just an encouragement, as Jessica mentioned at the very top of the webinar, to put any questions um, or comments into the chat, because we would really like to have a robust discussion at the end of this presentation. This area is one that we are um, really concerned about at the center and really excited about because there's a lot of opportunity here for change across the country. And, you know, a lot of the folks on this call, I have um, an intuition are going to be part of making that change happen here in Maine um, and can also lend some really great lessons learned. Maine has some really great lessons learned for the country. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot to be, uh, there's a lot of stake here. I guess I'll, I'll open by saying that. Next slide, please. So who we are at the center, um, so we're a team of lawyers who work to improve access to healthcare and quality of healthcare. And our focus is really on the health of people who are living with chronic disease and have limited resources. And so we do all of our work, we choose all of our projects through that lens, and we're actively engaged in trying to realize more equitable public health and healthcare systems. And so, you know, when we take on our projects, we look for areas where people who are more likely to have chronic disease or are living with chronic disease, where those folks face unfair barriers or bear a disproportionate burden of risk. And that is exactly what we see here in the case of radon. So we really see a regulatory system in our country that has extremely large gaps in who it protects. And we see very specific populations who have less recourse to protect themselves who are falling into those gaps. And that's why we're so concerned here. A few years ago, we began to work with a group of individuals here in Maine to look at potential policy solutions to radon exposure. And so in the course of that Maine-specific research, we found that there was really no easily accessible and comprehensive analysis of radon law policy um, across the country. And so it was really difficult for us to look to other states and understand whether you know, Maine was an outlier in the radon protection space. And so as a result of that, we launched the 50 state survey of radon laws and regulations in three areas, which we think are, are really critical to protecting people from exposure to heightened levels of radon. So that's radon disclosure, right? Requirements to inform others of these elevated levels of radon. Radon testing is the second one. So that's the requirement to actually test for radon. And then the third one, which we're calling radon mitigation. So that means that if high levels of radon are discovered through testing, there's a requirement to take action to actually remediate that property, bring those levels down into a safer range. So we did our 50 state survey. Uh, what we found was really surprising to us. So we're gonna share those findings with you today. And they're also gonna be available in our forthcoming report uh, titled Rate on Risk Reduction, a Fractured Policy Landscape. And that is scheduled for release in January, 2021. So what you'll hear today are three things. Um, one is that rate on law and policy are extremely different from state to state. Uh, the second is that they, by and large, are really not comprehensive. So that means that even if there is a law or policy in place that's going to protect residents in some way, it's often very narrow and it leaves others vulnerable to exposure. And John talked a little bit about some of the groups in Maine who are more protected than others. So we've already heard examples of that. And at the end of you know, my part of this presentation, Rachel's gonna take us again back to Maine and really focus in on the laws and policies that are in place here in Maine. Um, and then the third thing is that every state, so every state across the country, including Maine, has action to take to really develop a comprehensive regulatory scheme that's gonna ensure that we know when high levels of radon are present, that everyone who should be informed actually is informed of those high levels, and that we have like an, an equitable 
um, scheme in place to support mitigation to lower the risks from radon exposure. Next slide, please. So John took us through um, what radon is and sort of how it gets into homes. And, and what I'm going to say here is that, you know, the health risks, I'm going to underscore that point that he made that the health risks are high. Um, here on the slide, you're going to see the fact that we emphasize in our report and what we generally use when we open conversations up with policymakers to motivate them to take action on radon. So what we want them to know, of course, is that these high levels of radon are fairly common. And we want them to really understand the link to lung cancer. So lung cancer is one of the leading causes of cancer death across the country. Um, and we have that as the highest, um, the leading cause of lung cancer for non-smokers, and then the second leading cause of lung cancer for people who smoke. Uh, and then some discussion in the literature of whether children are actually especially at risk for other forms of cancer, other um, chronic health conditions from exposure to radon. Next slide, please. And then here on the slide, you're going to see the EPA's map of average estimated indoor radon levels, uh, with the red zones, you know, noting where there's an average level above the EPA's recommended threshold for mitigation, which is uh, four picocuries per liter. And so you see Maine is incredibly red. Um, and what we tell policymakers is that these rates are at the county level. So radon risk is not uniform across the country. There is huge geographic variation um, within a county. And so we do need robust policies that make testing mandatory, that make disclosure mandatory, that make mitigation mandatory, um, regardless of how much red you see on the map, whether the county is red, because you can have high levels of radon in one home and not in the home next door. I think John made that point too. And that's why widely available um, and affordable testing is so important. And, you know, the good news is that once we know about those high levels of radon, action can be taken that bring those radon levels down. But the cost of radon testing and mitigation, John made this point too, falls on property owners, right? So the ability to test and mitigate is going to depend um, on whether individual and municipal budgets can stretch to accommodate that cost. Next slide, please. And so, you know, you might be thinking we have a global pandemic um, with all these unprecedented challenges to meet in the healthcare and public health space. So why do we prioritize radon right now? And I think, you know, the fact is that on this particular webinar, we've got a lot of radon experts, more than we've ever had before in any presentation we've given on radon. Um, and awareness of radon uh, exposure and the risks that follow from radon exposure are actually quite low. On this slide are some of the, you know, awareness raising efforts that we've seen states engage in. So here are some of the results from state radon poster contests. So kids are submitting their best radon themed art. Um, these are pretty common from state to state. And from West Virginia, we even have a full radon coloring book that you can download from their website. Um, but, you know, generally uh, the dangers of radon are not as widespread as they need to be to spur action. And that is because testing is not common and it's not required. Um, and so I'm going to ask Mary to pull up um, poll question number two so we can get a sense of sort of how many folks in the room have actually tested their homes for radon before. And Mary, when you have the results, you can just go ahead and pull those up. There is an incredibly high number of folks on this call, 75% who have actually tested their home for radon, which is amazing. Um, we've never seen that in any other presentation that we've given. So this is an amazing group. You should all give yourselves a round of applause. Um, and then next slide, please. Next, awesome, thanks. And so, you know, with the lung cancer risk, what we try to emphasize again is that the stakes are quite high. Um, with the current state of law and policy, one of the things we have here is an equity concern. So I'm going to ask Mary to bring up polling question three, polling question four, and polling question five. And I'm really in, in order, um, and I'm really excited to see the results in this group.
So mostly not applicable in this um, on this webinar, but slightly more are not tenants who do not know whether they're they have radon in their building. Can you bring up the next uh, question, Mary? Yep. And so here's where we're starting to see, you know, we do not know whether our kids are going to school in a building where there's elevated um, radon levels. And bring up the last question, please. Okay, and so, you know, this is really where the the concern is for us here at the Center for Health and Policy, where you've seen that, you know, we have members of our family in assisted living facilities, and we just don't know if they're being exposed to radon there. Uh, and so, in addition to the low-income homeowners who are going to find it challenging or even impossible to pay for testing or mitigation um, in their homes, we're really concerned about those tenants and rental properties. And Maine is unique in having the amount of protections that it does have for tenants um, across the country. Maine's a real standout in that space. Um, but we're also concerned about kids who spend a great deal of time in schools or daycare centers. Um, and we're concerned about folks who live in 24 hour um, care facilities like nursing homes. We're concerned about a residence of correctional facilities where they can be exposed without having the agency to take action for themselves to address that risk. And you know, now that we're in winter, where people are spending even more time indoors with windows closed, um, you know, I was hoping that it would be a good time to mitigate schools and other public buildings for radon, but the pandemic is complicating everything. But January is National Radon Action Month, so it's also a time when a lot of state legislatures are just coming into session. Um, so it's a perfect time to bring this issue to the forefront. Next slide, please. And then the reality is that the, most of the action is going to have to be at the state level. There's a small federal program, um, the EPA State Indoor Radon Grant Program, that spreads about you know eight million dollars across 46 to 49 states per year. So if for argument's sake that was spread equally across the states, it'd be about 165,000 per state per year. That's not in any way enough to support all of the amazing work that John and his team do, um, let alone, you know, have money um, for testing and everything that we would want to really help to support. There are also limits on how this money can be spent. So many states are using it to fund their radon control programs, um, but because these funds are so small, they're vulnerable to being cut from the federal budget, right? It was not included in the president's most recent proposed budget. It's difficult for states to rely on these funds. And then there's no radon specific funding at the federal level that states or municipalities can tap into to support mitigation because these funds are actually barred by statute from being used for mitigation. Next slide, please. So, you know, what do we really need in terms of policy at the state level? It's critical to have here, as you do in Maine, a really robust radon control program. Um, but we need those programs to be supported by uh, a robust policy scheme because that's what we, that's what's going to make the efforts of John and his team sustainable over time. Um, so we need a comprehensive scheme that protects especially vulnerable residents and ensures that we can bring down high levels of radon wherever they're found. And so we think that we need, you know, three elements of these policies working together, disclosure, mandating that if we know about a high level of radon, we're telling people, testing, you know, we need to know, and then mitigation. We need to require that action be taken to bring down those levels of radon. These are pieces of a puzzle. They're complementary. We need them all um, working together to make sure that we're actually protecting people uh, in, in, in the best way. Next slide, please. 
So let's start with disclosure statutes. Let's talk about what's going on across the country. Um, these are laws that require, not just encourage, not just recommend, they actually require disclosing the known presence of radon. A majority of states, but not all, have enacted some form of radon disclosure requirements. But what you can see here on the slide is that the vast majority of these requirements really apply only in the case of a real estate transaction. So you're looking at a fairly narrow circumstance in which the presence of radon is actually going to be disclosed to you. Um, and so even if there is a known elevated um, risk of radon or, or known elevated presence of radon, it may not be disclosed to you when you're enrolling your kid in school. It may not be disclosed to you as a parent of an infant in a daycare or a family member when you're you know, looking at assisted living facilities for family members. So even if there is a known presence of radon, you may not necessarily find out. And another um, important thing to emphasize is that not all of these states with disclosure requirements have a testing requirement. So if you only have this the requirement to disclose as part of a real estate uh, transaction, but not a requirement to test, what's your incentive to test? You know, do you actually have a disincentive to test your home for radon if you're going to have to disclose it um, in a real estate transaction? So ideally, those two things would be paired. Next slide, please. And so moving on to testing, you know, ideally that states are going to mandate both testing and disclosure, but less than half of states, only about 15 are mandating testing at this time. Those testing requirements are mostly focused on schools and public buildings, um, but they actually, uh, you know, there's a wide variety in what they actually cover across the country. Some are only covering public schools, some public and private, um, some requiring only those schools and counties with that high um, EPA red zone designation to be tested. Uh, and we've covered why that's problematic, right? Because you can have wide variation within a county and rate on uh, present outside of those red counties. Some testing requirements are recurring every five or 10 years. Some require testing once and then never again. So we see enormous um, variation in these policies from state to state, and they're really not correlated with geographic risk. So Florida has a relatively low geographic level of risk that actually has one of the most comprehensive testing policies because it requires testing in both schools and assisted living facilities. Um, but if you look at the map, you know, you see South Dakota and Wyoming, you know, they are very, very red states and from that EPA map, and they have no laws and regulations around um, testing, mandatory testing. This doesn't mean testing isn't happening in those states, right, and that there aren't radon control programs in those states that are doing really good work. It just means they, they aren't required by law to do any testing. Next slide. And then finally, really quickly, until I turn it over to Rachel, I'm just going to talk about mitigation. So when you have high levels of radon, there are actions you can take to bring those levels down to a safer range. That's what we're referring to when we talk about mitigation. But there are only five states on this map that are requiring mitigation by law in very narrow circumstances, right? So we have Idaho requiring mitigation only for residential group homes. We have New York, Rhode Island, and West Virginia requiring it in schools. Um, we've got New Hampshire requiring it for disturbed water sources. I mean, and that's because mitigation costs money, right? So you had a mitigation requirement here in Maine for rental properties that was then removed. Um, very few states have any programs or funds dedicated to helping residents or schools or other enterprises afford those mitigation costs. But there are states that have actually really creative programs that could be used as models. So we have Colorado. Um, using a revenue from a tax on a hazardous waste to fund a low-income radon mitigation assistance program. So that helps about 100 low-income homeowners every year install radon mitigation systems in their homes. Minnesota um, has a rehabilitation loan program. So that has a deferred 0% interest loan for low-income homeowners to help them remediate various environmental hazards, including radon in their homes. And then those are forgiven if they basically live in their properties until the loan reaches maturity. So there are creative ways that states have found to fund these, um, to fund mitigation, to help with mitigation, but it is by and large a state responsibility. I'm gonna pass it over to Rachel. Thank you, Sarah. And Mary, if you wanna to head to the next slide. And so whereas Sarah gave you the highlight of the 50 state survey, 
We want to spend the next few minutes connecting the survey to specific radon policies here in Maine. And if we have the time, although I'm looking at the clock, we'll talk about neighboring states. You can head to the next slide. This is just a restatement of the idea that much of Maine was in, is in an EPA designated zone one, um, which really indicates high risk of exposure that warrants robust risk reduction measures. And so where does Maine stand in terms of its current policy? There are good starting points with disclosure requirements, including as we've been hearing for schools, resident, residential properties, rental properties, and there are also these testing requirements that we've been talking about, right? Maine is actually quite unique in requiring any testing at all in rental properties, but there's room for improvement. So here in Maine, the requirement is that landlords must test new properties once and then every 10 years on request by a tenant. But how many tenants are aware of this right? We saw in the survey, maybe half. And of those that are aware, how many are empowered to make that request for testing? A stronger mandate requires recurring testing every set number of years, independent of any action by an individual to set it into motion. Moving down the chart, we didn't identify any explicit protections regarding testing support or for mitigation, either mitigation requirements or mitigation support. You know, we can celebrate Radon Awareness Month, we can help people understand radon risks, but where again are we if people are left without recourse? So this leaves really significant room for improvement and, and a lot of opportunity. You know, going back to our review and reflecting on John's comments about what we'd like to see in Maine, there are really innovative policies out there that support vulnerable communities. So states can, can commit to sufficient testing support for a range of entities. States can mandate mitigation as a condition of facility licensure. And so we see in Florida, for example, a requirement for mitigation in schools, in residential care facilities, and a broad range of 24-hour care facilities. Idaho requires mitigation in group homes. Now, these examples are still highly targeted and specific, but there are more glimpses of what can be done. And then, as discussed, states can provide direct support for mitigation assistance or loans. And I should qualify that, you know, this snapshot provided by our chart does not account for two things. The first is that there's a law in the books in Maine creating something called a radon relief fund. This is a non-lapsing fund to support radon-related research, testing, educational, and mitigation activities. But we were unable to find out a ton of information about how well financed the fund is, how the resources are used, how active it is. And so in other words, we couldn't quite understand whether the law is enforced. The second point was that our research really focused on laws and regulations and not the amazing activities of radon control programs. As we saw from John's presentation, they do a ton of amazing work, including here in Maine. But as a program, there isn't that built-in long-term sustainability that laws and other policies provide, right? So we've heard it a few times now, radon control programs often rely on grants to fund a short-term intervention. And then programs also depend on strong law and policy to compel actions by private and public actors, as opposed to, for example, relying on um, voluntary engagement. So I think I'll stop there without getting to what's happening on the next slide and elsewhere in New England, but I'm happy to go over that as part of, um, as part of a question or answer. Wonderful, thank you so much, Sarah and Rachel. Tremendous work, uh, really interesting. Um, really enjoyed the maps and really seeing how, um, you know, the really looking at disclosure and testing mitigation across the United States and that main perspective with John and both of you too. So thank you so much. So Jonathan, I'm gonna have you join us via video. And at this point, we have about 10 minutes, which is great to answer any questions that you may have. One of the first questions that was asked, asked about downloadable handouts. So we are gonna be sending all attendees a copy of these slides and you will, it will be in a format that you can easily print them. So you'll be able to have these for reference. 
We do have some questions also in the uh, chat. <clears throat> so, um, and then also some in the question and answer. So one of the first questions was, why did Maine get no funding while most other states did? Well, we, uh, we have, um, we get funding from the, the uh, uh, funds for Healthy Maine, which is part of the tobacco uh, deal. So we get funding from there that pays my salary. We also uh, didn't uh, receive CERG 30. For the last 29 years, we've received received um, CERG, which is the uh, state indoor radon grant. We didn't get 30, I think, which was last year because we um, received a multi-purpose grant from the EPA and that's what we're using for schools at this point in time. Excellent, thank you, John. And then again, a question was about the, the slides for the presentations. And again, you'll be getting all of those. And then we had someone um, also ask, can someone differentiate between elevated radon levels in air versus water? Are there differences in risk when we look at air versus water levels? And how do we, and then Sorry. the last, no, that's okay. It's like a three-parter. Um, again, so differentiate between elevated radon levels in air versus water. Are there differences in risk when we look at air versus water levels? And how do we approach mitigation when water levels are elevated? Thank you. It, sure. Okay. Yes, there is. Drinking radon, uh, is not as much of a problem as breathing it. <clears throat> so what happens when the water is agitated, uh, like taking a shower or washing clothes or something, the radon's released from the water into the air. And the University of Maine did a study for, let's say, a family of four. Uh, they figured out that uh, possibly for every 10,000 picocuries per liter of, of radon in water, when you released it, would release one picocurie into the air. So, um, so water is much higher. For instance, on the EPA has written in stone that the air radon level will be 4.0, no ifs, ands, or buts, you know, 4.0 or less. Um, however, the EPA has never written um, a standard for, for radon. So that's why uh, we say 4,000. I, I think New Hampshire's got 2,000, maybe Massachusetts 10,000, because there's nothing really, really written in stone. And the reason we say 4,000 here in Maine is because if you divide 4,000 by 10,000, that gives you 0.4. And 0.4 is probably the background radon level. If you went outside, took a deep breath, you probably breathe in 0.4 radon. So at this point in time, the risk for radon, and, I, and I've been studying this for a long time, the risk for radon from water is very, very little compared to the risk of breathing it in your home. It just adds to it. But in Maine, we've had some high radon levels. Um, to take care of it, um, to mitigate it, for instance, to mitigate radon out of air will cost you between oh, 1100 uh, to $1,800, depending on the shape of the house and everything else. To take it out of water, if you have 10000 or less, maybe $1,500 to get rid of it. If you got more than that, you're probably looking at uh, $4,000 to $7,000 to take it out of your water. And so it, it, gets, it gets pricey as, as we go on. Um, uh, so that's, that's why. Just to let you know, main average is about 11000 in um, average in water, so already we're above that 4,000. Um, but um, the highest I think I've seen recorded was out of Leeds, Maine, it's somewhere around the 2 million in the water. If you're curious. Excellent, thank you, John. Sure. Another question was, would this presentation be available in the future? And the answer is yes, we actually have this as well as all other Maine Lung Cancer Coalition webinars. They're on YouTube and you can, we're gonna put up a slide at the very end um, that will show you the link for the, or you can also just Google the Maine Lung Cancer Coalition and you'll be able to go under health professionals and under resources and you'll be able to access this presentation. So the question we have is what do, and I think you just answered this, uh, John, with average mitigation costs and what those look like. So I think you just answered that question. Sure, yeah, depending on the, the shape of the house or, or what you have, a slab on grade or, or basement, you're probably looking to spend between $1,100 and, and $1,800 to get rid of it. Basically what they do is um, they'll come in and they'll, if it's a basement, they'll put a five inch hole in the floor, take out about 10 gallons worth of dirt, stick a four inch pipe underneath the basement floor, pipe it to the outside of the house, put a fan in at ground level, exhaust it up by your roof, turn the fan on, it depressurizes underneath your home and takes out all the radon before it even enters your house. That's how that works. Excellent. 
Thank you, John. So another one asked, are we going to have more of these types of classes? So I take that as a positive and we're very happy to see that. And with the CME, you're gonna get a survey and evaluation. And so certainly if you have ideas or you know different things that you'd like um, further webinars on, please feel free to submit them and we'll have, be happy to take a look at those ideas. Um, let's see, if there's time, one of the questions was when somebody asked, what is New Hampshire doing? Sure. So New Hampshire has um, a testing requirement that attaches to public buildings. They also have a mitigation requirement um, that is limited to water sources. And then, test, um, they, and then the state also provides testing support. Excellent. Thank you, Rachel. Another question. Mitigation deduction from taxes, is that similar to solar? So I think it's asking if there's a, a tax deduction for you, if you do mitigate that's similar to like solar power. Um, I don't think there is, no. Okay. Let's see, another question is, love all these questions, excellent. What is your best advice to residential homeowners in Maine on how to pursue testing? Are there recommended radon providers? Yes, yes, there are. We have, um, we have about 130 uh, testers uh, listed, and, uh, about 150 at all. But yes, everyone has his license. Um, you can actually, if the house is not for sale, you can actually test it yourself. You can go to Home Depot. You can go one of the four private labs in the state that do the testing or to the state lab. You can actually test it yourself. It's pretty easy. It's just two little containers. You take the caps off, you set them there for 48 hours, close them back up and, and send them in. And uh, they usually go, if you get them at Home Depot or Lowe's, they go to a laboratory in Texas or in, or in Florida, but we've already licensed them. I've looked at their quality assurance plan, so they know, they know what they're doing. Uh, if your house is for sale, then yes, you can hire a, a licensed tester to come in and he'll, he'll set it up and do the test. Usually the home inspector is licensed. And you can go on our website and find out who is licensed, who isn't, or you can just call me and I can tell you. Excellent. Thank you again, John. Sure. Question, are there innovative mitigation strategies that are in play or on the horizon? Um, good question. You, the theory is basically the same. Uh, I've seen improvements on building a better mousetrap, but basically, um, the way you get rid of radon in a house in the air is to transport it outside. And um, there's not much change in that unless there's changes in fans or maybe changes in, in piping material or something like that that might make it cheaper. Uh, as far as water radon goes, the theory of how you get rid of uh, water and radon is basically either using a shower technique or a bubble up technique, uh, aeration techniques. And those theories have been around for a while. I've seen a new um, uh, uh, mitigation of uh, for water radon come out recently. It's got a much smaller footprint than the others and it's much cheaper. Um, whether it works or not, I'm not sure yet. I haven't seen any data on it. But uh, outside of that, the only thing that's been improved is like building a better mousetrap. The, the removal equipment that we have now for water was the same that the, um, the, the University of Maine came up with you know, 30 years ago, except maybe improved a little bit on. That's it. Great, thank you. Sure. The question is, can you elaborate on the 4,000 Picuri, I think you said, I'm um, not saying that right, liters to the oh. 10,000 Picuri to liter main testing level? Yes. The, uh, since there really is no, there is a main law that says if you're a community water system like the Portland Water District or the Augusta Water District, your limit is 4,000 Picuri or less. Um, however, <laughs> if you're uh, uh, non-transit, non-community water system like a daycare center, you're allowed up to 20,000 PPQ rates. So um, our limit used to be, about 10 years ago, our limit used to be 20,000, then we dropped it down to 4,000. But I, people, what we have to look at is your air radon and your water radon together to determine radon risk. So even though it's above 4,000, so that, that's why we say if it's above 4,000 but below 10,000, give me a call, let's talk about it. Let's compare your air radon to what might be released from your water radon to see if you really have to spend that, you know, four to seven grand where you might be reducing your radon level by another two tenths of 1%. And that's why I have them give me a call. 
Great, thank you. Someone asked to chat back the cost you cited for the range for water, re water remediation. I think you had said four to 7,000. Is that what you had mentioned? That's correct. The reason for that is the cleanliness of the water. How this works is water is bubbled up through holes and a lot of them called the bubble up system. And, and because the water is agitated, the radon is released and, and exhausted out of, the, out of the machine. But if you have iron and manganese, which we do in Maine, hardness or anything like that, it'll plug up those holes before they, and after a while, the efficiency of that machine is lost. So you have to pre-treat first. So if you don't have a really clean water, you gotta put on a water softener, pre-treat it first. That's your three grand, and then your four grand for your unit. So that's where the seven grand comes in. Depends on your water. Great, thank you. So we have time probably for one more question. I'm sorry, we have a bunch of questions, which is wonderful. So I'm just gonna, we had a, in the chat from Rachel Sukfor to all panelists, there's a link um, to the main website that explains um, how to find a main license rate on tester or mitigator. So that's in the chat. And in case you didn't know, if, the, if you um, click on the ellipsis at the bottom, you can save the chat. And so you'll be able to have these, these references as well. And uh, we will also put some of these resources um, into the question and answer one pager that we'll be sending out as well. So just for sake of time, again, I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but again, we will create a question and answer. We will loop back with our wonderful presenters and answer those questions and send those responses to all your questions out with the slide deck, which will be mailed to all of you as well. And again, you can easily download that. So again, on behalf of the Maine Lung Cancer Coalition and the Maine Medical Association Center for quality improvement. Thank you so much, Jonathan, uh, Rachel, and Sarah. It was wonderful having you all. You did a terrific job.